Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Zone for the 20th of July 2013, episode number 248. Well, not long till the big 250. Richard Saunders here with you from uh, the beautiful Orange County in California, where I'm spending a few days to get myself together, relax a little bit with my dear friend Brian Dunning and family before flying home. What a wonderful time I had, my friends, at the amazing meeting in Las Vegas. Wow, was I, was I a, a busy skeptic, very busy skeptic, helping to organize the Million Dollar Challenge, giving some talks and uh, doing whatever I could to make the event interesting and fun for everybody. Now, I'll be talking more about the Million Dollar Challenge in the weeks to come. In fact, I'll have to uh, write a report about it, I think, for Swift. That should be very interesting. But uh, a big thanks to DJ Grothy and Banachek and Jamie Inswith and Chip Dedman, James Randi himself, of course, who uh, worked so closely together to get the Million Dollar Challenge up and running and uh, brought to a very successful and entertaining conclusion, I think. Well, more about that in the weeks to come. On this week's show, a couple of bits from the amazing meeting. We chat to members of the St. Louis Skeptical Society, who happened to be passing me one day in the huge hallway there at the, uh, at the convention. I grabbed them and sat them down, and they talk about their local skepticism. After that, we have some more science news with Dr. Paul Willis from the Royal Institution of Australia. Sort of fill-in bits. While the official week in science is on a bit of a hiatus, Paul Willis is still cranking out some interesting science news for us. And to round off the show, an interview I did with a very dear old friend of mine, Derek Colin Duno from the Skepticality podcast. Love to catch up with Derek. Don't see him very much. He lives in Atlanta. I live in Sydney. I think you can understand not as easy as we'd hope, but still, it was lovely to see him at the amazing meeting. And to all those people I saw at the amazing meeting, whether I was able to give you lots of time or hardly any time as I rushed by in a blur to get this done or get that done, great to see everybody there. And the reports I'm getting back, so positive. People had a wonderful time, enjoyed the uh, interesting talks and enjoyed meeting people and the social aspects too, usually ending up in the Del Mar bar. But for now, while I contemplate tonight's feast, which will be at a place called the Crab Cooker, the Crab Cooker, Google it. If you don't know where that is, Google Crab Cooker. That's where I'm heading tonight and can't wait. I'm going to contemplate that for the next little while while we all listen to The Skeptic Zone. It's uh, Friday here at the amazing meeting in Las Vegas. Lots of people running around, although most of the people are in at the moment listening to the man himself, James Randi. But I found some strange people wandering around the hall. I've grabbed them off the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe table. And who do we have here? Uh, I'm Missy Rung Blue. I'm Dave Blue. Mike Bateman. I thought you were saying blue because of the color of your T-shirts, but that's... <laughs> no, 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 no. It's Mine's a hyphenated, yes. Oh, I see. Yeah, we're, we're together. Now, you're from, and you're all wearing the same shirt, which is really cool, with the skull with the glasses and the, the telescope and the magnifying glass. It looks very good. And the, and the test tube beaker sort of mm-hmm. yes. flask. The Skeptical Sci- uh, Society of St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Yes. What can you tell me about that? Oh, my gosh. Um, I... How long have founded we even? By DJ, right? Yeah, really. Yeah, it yeah really. DJ, it, they were founded by DJ. Um, when DJ Gerthy. D- yes, yeah. when, when he lived in St. Louis. Yeah, when DJ to used to live in right. St. Louis as part of the the Center for Inquiry there, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so it's been around for several years. Dave and I got involved. I don't know, maybe four, four, five, four five years, years ago. ago. Yeah. Um, Pamela we, Gay came to town to give a presentation, and they had a meetup in Edwardsville, Illinois, which is across the river, and we went there, and um, 
met a bunch of cool people yeah. and started going to the skeptics in the pubs. Yeah, so. met Mike Plantford, who used to Eventually be the education coordinator with J. Ref. Yeah, that's and, what we met. Is that skeptics then, in the pub? Yeah, we met yeah. there. And is, how, how's the skeptics in the pub scene in St. Louis? Is it a big scene? Do you get many people coming along? It's but, slow. It always slows during the summer. Yeah, it slowed down. But we're we're trying to get some more just informal without speakers just to get people together more often even when we don't have someone to give a talk so um. I think that's a great idea because uh, speaking uh, personal experience skeptics in the pub in Sydney was originally founded uh, 10 years 10 odd years ago without the idea of having a speaker we just wanted to get together and have a, a, a drink and, a, and, and something to eat and, and chat right. it wasn't until some years later that every now and then we'd have a speaker now it's a regular part so I don't think it's a vital part of skeptics in the pub no I don't I don't think so either and um, I mean they're always interesting when we have them but it's just nice to get together yeah. with your own ilk sort of thing too and have you know be able to talk to people get different ideas about skepticism science you know whatever's on and a beer and a beer yeah. <laughs> lots of beer and if we find the right place some good food too right. so oh, I yeah. think that's very important yeah yeah now, I'll ask the, um, the two questions I know my, my good friend Maynard likes to ask people. Is one, why did you get into skepticism individually? Why? And after that, what woo, may we say, what, what in this realm, what really annoys you? What gets your goat? Oh, okay. Mm. Um, well, Dave and I probably got into skepticism sort of together. He started listening to Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, and we would play it in the car and stuff so I would be with him and we both really enjoyed it yeah. and, uh, and I think before that I would read, the only thing I knew about skepticism was Michael Shermer's column in Scientific American mm -hmm. so I'd read that and then I started to get into podcasts and I was like I wonder if there's any science or skeptic podcasts and that's how I found <laughs> Skeptic's Guide and Skeptoid and you know, oh. a few others way yeah, back and yeah. that's what we started listening to so. and yeah. now you're ending up on the Skeptic Zone podcast yes, so there you go <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I had never heard of skepticism until really, like, Skeptic's Guide. I think I just always have been kind of a questioning person. I mean, I can remember, like, learning about the Crusades in high school and being like, really? You know, I don't understand how, you know, this is about religion, and then religion tells us this other thing. And I, you know, so I started thinking about that a little bit. I think that started me was Chariots of the Gods. Ah, Van Dunnigan. Yeah, I saw that in the movie theater. And at the time, I had no experience to skepticism at all, although almost everything I saw in there seemed a bit dubious, but I didn't know why. And so I just started doing some research and came across books that had counter-arguments and found that very fascinating. Yeah, it is. And, yeah, and so that, that was sort of the beginning, and then started reading books, and eventually podcasts came along and stumbled across some podcasts, including yours, and... So it just grew from there. And what, what in the the alternative universe or the psychic realm or the woo woo, whatever, what do you want to want to call it? What grabs your attention or what annoys you? Um, well, I have to admit that I used to believe some of that stuff too. That's okay. Yep, I used to do acupuncture. I've been to two George Dillman uh, seminars and um, which they discuss in the martial yeah, arts panel. Yeah, which they discuss in the martial arts panel. So. But I think right now, like, what tends to get me is more the biological medical science oh, stuff. Yeah. So the anti-GMO, um, mm -hmm. you know, the organic um, mythos mm -hmm. or whatever. Yes, yes. Um, and then, of course, you know, any of the non-science-based medicine, uh, homeopathy, acupuncture, you know, whatever cleansers out there <laughs> or whatever. So that's kind of where my interest okay. revolves right now. Yeah, I think I'm sort of in the same area. The, what seems most pervasive right now is just lots of naturalistic stuff, you know, naturalistic fallacy everywhere, GMO stuff. It's trendy, isn't it? It's very trendy, yeah. Yeah, it's very trendy right now. Um, I, I, I have a lot of friends who... I see eye to eye with on lots of things, but then they'll be posting without references, you know, <laughs> GMOs call, cause cancer in lab rats and blah, 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 and I have to decide whether or not I'm going to engage, and if I do, I try to be as nice as I can, but yeah. you know, here, yeah, check this out. That's story, that's right. Yeah, yeah. but, um, yeah. What about you? Uh, conspiracy theories. Ah, yes. You drive me nuts. <laughs> um, you know, seeing YouTube videos of Alex Jones and Glenn Beck and... Yeah, those those really trip my trigger. The but you know, but the interests of, of, of you know my my areas of interest have evolved over time. At one time it was religion. At one time it was alternative medicine. 
Um, now I think it's conspiracy theories. It really just and there's a show that you can see on YouTube, um, which I saw some months back, called Conspiracy Theory Road Trip. Mm. I think you'd all enjoy this, especially wow. because it really concerns conspiracy theories. This is a, a UK show, but they get a bunch of conspiracy theorists in say uh, 9/11, put them all on a bus, and take them and speak to experts and see if they can change their minds. Oh, I have seen that. I have. Yeah, I have seen that. Yeah, interesting. It's fast. Yeah, it, it's worth looking for. Conspiracy yeah. theory road trip. Yeah, it's, it's quite fun. Yeah. Sounds good. Yes. So, for those listeners in Australia, whereabouts is St. Louis? St. Louis. Yeah. Pretty much um, kind of the middle of the country. The Mississippi River comes down and kind of divides the country. Mm-hmm. And we're just west of that. So, St. Louis is called the Gateway to the West, the arch, the, the St. Louis arch designed by what, Eero Saarinen. I don't know if I'm saying that name correctly, the architect was built in 1960, mid-1960s. It's kind of the, the symbol for St. Louis, the landmark, the We're big landmark. Five hours south of Chicago mm-hmm. oh, okay. and yeah. about 10 hours north of the Gulf Coast. Is that about right? No, we're like 10 hours north of Dallas. And okay, so you got a long way yeah. to go to go to the beach, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. so we have a long way to go to go to, <laughs> no yeah, we're, we're landlocked, yeah, we're landlocked. So it's about a four-hour flight to San Francisco, three hours to here. So, yep. That's pretty good. And do you have a, a web presence? St. Louis Skeptical. No, people. we have Meetup. Yeah. We have a meetup and we have and a Facebook. Facebook. Oh, that's, that's enough. Yes. Yeah. And, and if, if our listeners in that area are interested in, in hooking up with you guys, how, Absolutely. they just Google the Skeptical Society of St. Louis. Yep. And that, yep. Should, yep. that should get them. That should either find our Facebook page or the meetup. And when we have you know a gathering, we put it on meetup and everybody knows. So. Yes, I, actually, I think they do the event on both Facebook and Yeah, Facebook. Yeah, we will do it on so. both places. All right, easy to find, folks. There's the word. Well, folks, great to see you here, Tam. I hope yeah, you're having thanks. a good time. Yeah, we are. Uh, yeah. Thanks for talking to the Skeptic Zone, and have a, a great rest of the conference. Thank you. You thanks. too. Skeptic Zone. 我是丽斯, 我们的网址是skeptoy.com.cn Skeptoy是一个科学类podcast节目 我们每期都会讨论新的话题 包括探讨流行的传奇故事, Skeptoid.com.cn The Skeptoid Science Podcast by Brian Dunning is now available for Chinese audience. Please tell your Chinese friends to visit Skeptoid.com.cn or find Skeptoid on the Chinese iTunes store. I'm Li Si from Skeptoid.com.cn Hello Skeptopodies, Dr Willis here at the Royal Institution of Australia with more musings and news from the world of science. And the big talking point this week has been the results of a science literacy survey in Australia that shows, shock horror, Australians know less about science than they did a couple of years ago. The survey was conducted for the Australian Academy of Science and asked one and a half thousand people some simple science questions. Less than two-thirds knew how long it takes for the Earth to go around the Sun, down from 75% two years ago. And just under 30% did not know if humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time. These disastrous results caused a cavalcade of conniption fits across the old-school science establishment, with calls for more science education and more effective science communication. But I am a bit more sceptical. It's not just that 1,500 people seems like a small sample size to be able to generalise across the whole country. The whole concept of science literacy has come into question in recent years, and it's apparent that we are not entirely sure what it measures, what appropriate levels are, or even why it matters. Even scientists can't agree on how to measure it. Take the walking with dinosaurs question, for example. 
As a paleontologist, I would answer that yes, humans and dinosaurs have been around at the same time and still are. Birds are dinosaurs. That's where the interesting science is in that question. However, what they were asking was about the extinct non-avian dinosaurs from the Mesozoic. So I would have got that question wrong. With scientists themselves in conflict as to what questions to include and what the correct answers are to those questions, these types of surveys are doomed as non-starters from the get-go. And so, what if 100% of the population don't know the correct answers to some science trivia? How much do they need to know? And more importantly, why do they need to know it? Most people will get through life just fine with a complete ignorance of basic astronomy, biology, geology and all the other sciences. What are we trying to achieve by turning our nation into a population of science quiz masters? It's time for a rethink on the whole question of the public understanding of science. And that is the subject of a blog I published on our site a couple of weeks ago. You can still find it at riaus.org.au under Telling Stories for Science. It's right alongside my latest blog where I champion sceptical thinking. You might want to take a read of that while you're there. Getting off my soapbox, and I've not got much time left for the other news in science for this past week. So, here are the headlines. Researchers have explained how telomeres, the protective bits of DNA at the ends of our chromosomes, can be cancer-preventing, and yet they turn cancer-promoting when certain genes are mutated in patients. New research from the USA shows that women who survive childhood cancer are at an increased risk of infertility. Australian scientists have helped reveal the genomes of hundreds of bacterial and archaeal cells belonging to 29 major, mostly uncharted branches of the Tree of Life. The record of satellite observations of ice loss from Greenland and Antarctica is currently too short to separate long-term trends from short-term natural variability. And Swiss researchers have used sound waves to cancel out the pull of gravity and levitate small quantities of matter. As usual, for more on these and other science news stories of the week, go to the RIOS website, riaus.org.au. And that's your lot for this week, Potties. I'll have another grumble and update next week. Dr Willis, signing off. You know when two podcasters get together, ladies and gentlemen, because we talk about the size of our memory cards. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> what else am I going to do? My, my normal memory is, you know, a little shot these days. So, <laughs> I'm talking with none other than Derek Colanduno from Skepticality, one of the, the original podcasts, one of the original skeptical podcasts. Yeah, me and Steve Novella tried to figure that out, out uh, like last year or the year before, and uh, we were... We beat them by like two weeks. No, really? Yeah. Well, the zone's been going since 2008. I did other things before then that weren't uh, really as regular as the skeptic zone. Uh, and I was doing a radio series way back in uh, heavens about 2001 or something. But as an official skeptical podcast goes, you guys are older than the zone, of course. Yeah, it was funny that you mentioned that because uh, before podcasting, I was doing a show like Skepticality. It was just me. Uh, and that was back between, like, 96 and, like, 2002. And there was no RSS enclosure feeds. Yeah, People yeah. didn't use yeah. podcasting. Cause it, so, and also, MP3s were hard to do on a normal computer because yeah. it was just hard to, like, crunch the compression. It, it, it's funny how we, we've gotten so used to the technology. I know. So, I, that my old show was, on, was done in real audio. Real audio. Yeah. That's the format I used to use, and I used to use that to compress and make videos. But that's why. And when that came out, I even bought the encoder. Yeah, I me thought, too. This is great. This will be the future. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I did my show using that, and uh, because we didn't have podcasting, the only way I could get people to listen to it is I had to put it on the website and like send emails to everybody. Yeah, well, a new show came yes. out. Yes. So you know, and now it, it, it went away because you know it's a lot of work. Mm. You know, it was a lot wor- of work not just to do the show, but to like do all the back end to tell people so I just this fell off fell off and I got married and I got 
another job where I was traveling 98% of the time. So it was just, this is why I went away. And then podcasting hit, and one day Swoopy said, have you seen this? Because, you know, this is the show we have always wanted to do. Because yeah. I used to actually work in, work in radio here in Vegas. Um, and I did an overnight shift. So me and Swoopy would talk about what we wanted to do, but I worked for a uh, alternative rock station. So, you know, that was back in the 90s. Go figure. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we were there at night thinking, well, we'd like to do... We'd like, so we tried to do little segment things, but, you know, you really couldn't. Uh, so when podcasting came out she said hey that, we could do that radio show we always wanted to do so it took a while so she came up with the name one day and i got home from a business trip and was on the whiteboard and said what is that she said name of our show oh really <laughs> yeah so that's how that happened that's how well when we were putting the skeptic zone together we came up with all sorts of crazy names too yeah and then uh, uh our co-host stefan soika in one of these exchanges and emails said the skeptic zone and suddenly everyone went yeah, yeah. It just it just sort of stuck. Now, of course, I first met you at TAM in two thousand and eight, if my memory was serves. Eight. Mm. My first TAM was two thousand six. So that's about right. I think I, I met I you and Swoopy. I yeah. was there at eight because it was a flamingo. Yeah. And then later that year, that same year, I traveled to Dragon Con. Yeah. And w- with my first Dragon Con, and I went there that year, the next year, and but the that, year after that. That was also the rec- first recording of Skeptic Zone. Yes, you're absolutely right. Skeptic Zone was born at Dragon Con 2008 in Georgia. Back when the yeah. Skeptic track was a very small room. Now, t- tell me more about the whole evolution of the Skeptic track at Dragon Con, because it, in the early days it was uh, it was good fun. I was there in the very early days, but it's it's just uh, it's big. blossomed there. Eh? Yeah. Well, let's say it started because. Uh, I was the director at DragonCon for the new media, media like uh, podcasting and web video and all that stuff. I was the director for that. Uh, and my co-director was Swoopy. There goes Evan Bernstein. Look, a rare sighting of Evan Bernstein walking down the hall. Hi, Evan. Am I, I going to uh, bomb this, uh, this uh, interview right now? Yeah, Hi. This is the meeting of the Skeptic Zone, the Skeptic's Guide, and Skeptic's Cal- uh, Skepticality. That, that's got. a lot of skeptics in one very, yeah. very concentrated <laughs> area, indeed. Where are you sneaking off to? I have to go do a, a quick audio check with the uh, engineers in the room for our uh, show oh, this right. morning. Yep. You guys usually did, like, something every morning. What happened? Yeah, well, you know, they finally decided to uh, bump us up to a uh, more, I don't know if you want to call it, prominent status, where we don't have to wake up at 5 in the morning each time in order to, you know... Sounds good to me. I'm up first today, you know that. I'm, I'm the guy who's up first. <laughs> so you have the... Uh, yeah. The honor of doing uh, of yeah. doing that kind of work. Yeah. It's like my thing this time was I was the very first thing at eight o'clock in the morning on Thursday. <laughs> yeah, no, there was a you know there the, the slots have uh, purposes and reasons and times. You oh know, well, but uh, you know, but we're no, we're happy to to be you know part of this in any capacity. I'll come in and heckle you. Yeah, please, you have to. <laughs> I'll let you get back to your interview. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you, guys. Evan Bernstein. Yay. So it was... Um, what was I say? Oh, yeah. yeah it so was growing. I was the, yeah. I was the uh, director for the new media stuff at Dragon Con. And because, you know, me and Swoopy did skepticality, we started to invite some of the guests we had on our show to come to Dragon Con. We didn't have a skeptic track, but we just... We teamed up with the space and science track, which was right next door. To of course, I remember that because in the very early days when I'd walk out, there'd be the science guys right there. Well, yeah. They still are. They still are. So right, right next door. Yeah. Uh, they finally, because the space and science tracks also kind of grew to make more room for the space track, they moved it one floor up, which is not that bad. And mm-hmm. there, if you remember, you don't have to even use a, the elevator. There's that little stairway. Yes, so it's yes. not that bad. Yeah, no, that's easy. Yeah. Yeah. So. That was fine, because the reason why they had to do that, really, was because they grew the skeptic room one more time, so we had that entire side of the hall. But anyway, at the beginning, it was just space and science, and me and Swoopy did the new media, but we had some of our skeptic guests, like George Rabb and uh, Jeff Wagg and uh, Phil Plate mm. and all these people, and I got them to, to come, and they just would go to the science and space tracks and they would pack rooms and then after about two years the guy who runs Dragon Gun uh, Pat Henry called me at home he said if I gave you a track for skeptics could you fill it at least 60% I said 60% that's the that's a very low bar yeah I can do that and uh, the first year I filled it 100% 
and I've, I've done that every year and I have no more space to grow but I told them I don't want to move because I like our location it's yeah I, I really loved the three times I did Dragon Con the, the only reason I haven't done it in the last few years is um, probably because it's, it's such a long long trip it's a big factor, I must so it's say. Only, it's only three hours longer than here. <laughs> but I, I did it once with um, uh, uh, Steve Roberts from the Australian Skeptics and Dr. Rachie and I all flew out together. Oh, yeah. And we flew from Sydney, a uh, stopover in L.A. to change planes, and then to Atlanta, and we were pretty cooked. We were pretty fried by well, the time well, we from, got there. From what, Australia to L.A. has <laughs> got to be, what, like 16 hours? About 14 hours. Yeah, yeah but the, all those time zones. Anyway, but we loved it. But it's it's pretty it's pretty tough to um to be on deck and and uh, be thinking when your brain's scrambled from. Well, that's why I have to get zones. there like, like four three or four days early. I know, I know. <laughs> anyway, so I I'm keen to do it again, and we'll just see what happens next year. Because you're telling me in the three years I haven't been there, it's changed a lot. Well, we've the skeptic track room where we do our stuff has grown every year since. So you'll be kind of surprised because it's so big now. We have to have three or four of those big flat screen TVs so the audience can see everything. No, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. As wow. far as, it's, I, I say our room is like a really big airplane because it's like a nice long okay. tube almost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's fine because we have the TV screens and you can still see. It's just, we like to have like the screens you can put people's names under. Mm. Like that, yeah. Well, I mean, if, if listeners to this show, maybe even new listeners, if you go back through the archives... And you search for uh, Dragon Con. You'll see early uh, episodes of, the, of this Skeptic Zone where we interview famous celebrities and people at uh, this event, you know. Because when you're walking around Dragon Con, it's one of the, the things I'll never forget. I was in the, um, the lobby of the hotel doing something or other and walk, in walked uh, Brent Spiner Minor. and um, uh, the, the, the Riker, John, Jonathan Oh, Franks John Frakes. And, yeah. Both of them are really... I mean, yeah, Brent Spiner coolest guy did you take some time to talk to him I didn't actually because yeah. he just was walking past well that's yeah. the thing about Dragon Con I love not, is that it's a party more than a convention yeah even the people that are there the biggest stars you can just go up to them and I've made become really good friends with some of the people that you know just TV and movie actors it's because fun, isn't it? it's because it's just a big party yeah, yeah I, ch- than, I chatted to various stars from you remember the autograph room and there's stars from the last four decades there. Oh, yeah. And you can just chat to them. That's fantastic yeah. stuff. About two years ago, we had, uh, oh, what's his name that died recently? GR, JR. Oh, uh, Larry Hagman. Yes, he In was fact, a, that's where I saw him at Dragon Con yeah. as well. Yeah, one, he, one used, year. he usually yeah. come, he usually, yeah. used to usually come. And, yeah. Uh, it was kind of a shock when he died. It's like, wait a minute, we just saw him. Yeah, yeah it was too bad. Yeah. He was just a really nice guy, too. Yeah, so yeah, so we've been growing, and um, you missed the best event we've ever had on the track last year, though. What was that? We had on the big stage in the giant room, the atrium ballroom. I the, know the, it, the, yeah. The, the one that Huge holds room, like yeah. 10,000 people. Uh, we packed it, and we had James Randi and uh, Alice Cooper talking about the oh, time right. on, I heard about that. Yes. on the tour. Yes. I, I think they actually, uh, J-Ref got uh, the permission from the... Uh, Dragon Con and got their actual footage and they put it on uh, YouTube so you can actually watch that. Good, good. It's kind of cool. Good tip. Because there's tip. some great stories in there. Because that's the reason why I wanted it to happen. When I heard that Pat got um, Alice Cooper to come, I said, no, Randy has to come. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, it's one of the coolest things ever. You know, yeah. To have them on stage talking about that. Is he scheduled to go this year? James Randy? Originally, yes, but uh, he has to have uh, a medical oh, surgery they, right at the same time. Right. I I, I think I, I heard that the other day. That, yeah, uh, he was actually on. He's got, he told me he had some um, maintenance yeah. that he needs doing. <laughs> yeah. So he was on the schedule to do it, but um, then when they yeah. actually scheduled that, it happened to be right. Right in conflict. So. These things happen, Derek. Yeah. These things happen. Now let's look, gaze down the long hallway here. Because what the the thing, here I'm yet. looking. Yeah, I was just looking for the food. More oh, and more no, people are some gathering. Food. The, the coffee's there. Coffee might be the might be a good idea. I got to right, well, warm up my vocal cords right. because I'm up in about. Um, You're up first. Soon. It's like what what happened? I mean, I had to use. The, I was the first person on the first day at eight o'clock in the morning. What are you the first person on the Saturday? 
Well, don't forget, last night was Pendulette's bacon and... I couldn't even make it. Yeah, I didn't make I it so, either. I was so beat up. But a lot of people would have, and there are going to be a lot of bleary-eyed people in the That's audience. That's the thing. <laughs> I feel bad for you there. You might be like with the crowd that's either hung over well. or... There'll be there'll be enough people there, and uh, I get oh, my yeah. talk over and done with it, and I can sort of um, uh, do other things, which yeah. will be cool. Derek Colin, do know? Give my best to Swoopy, and thanks for being on the Skeptic Zone. No problem. Be Reasonable is a podcast of the Merseyside Skeptic Society, featuring Haley Stevens and Michael Marshall. Each monthly interview explores beliefs from outside of the mainstream, engaging with proponents of those beliefs to examine the evidence and reasoning behind each idea. In June's episode, we speak with Navina Shine, who made the headlines with her attempts to live for six months without food. Listen to Navina's story and back issues of the show by visiting merseysideskeptics.org.uk forward slash podcasts or search for Be Reasonable on iTunes. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone, and as some of you listen to this, no doubt I am somewhere over the Pacific, between San Francisco and Hawaii, probably, or maybe between Hawaii and Fiji, or Fiji and Sydney, and who knows where. Looking forward to getting home and having that wonderful jet lag feeling again. No, I can't recommend it enough. More amazing meeting highlights coming up over the next few weeks with interviews and bits and pieces. And also some interviews I recorded uh, in Hollywood just the other night with some good old sceptical friends. But for now, while I still contemplate tonight's crab cooker dinner, this is Richard Saunders signing off from the Orange County, California. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts, and extra video reports.